All right, hello everyone. It's me, it's the last Uchiha here. And as always, uh, follow me if you wanna follow yourselves and hopefully we get there together. So uh, this video is a little different. I got a reaction style video coming at you. And uh, what we're going to be discussing today or I wanna put out on the platform of YouTube in general for a wide conversation for anyone that wants to participate is uh, reacting and having a dialogue around, uh, you know, a really wonderful, and super entertaining documentary series uh, put out by a YouTuber named Shane who's you know an older YouTuber like myself have been around on the platform for a long time I've went nowhere which is wonderful and um, anyways the documentary is called The Mind of Jake Paul and uh, what I'd like to do is a little reaction sort of conversation around the first two uh, episodes and uh, I just want to unpack some of the stuff that was being said there and um, why I think we can use another lens or set of uh, explanations on some of the stuff that's being discussed. So um, just to identify myself, I'm about to be 35 despite this very young face when it's shaved I look hella young but um, it's my birthday soon. Uh, I come from the streetball community on YouTube, and I'm into anime and hip-hop and things of that nature, and uh, later got into social activism after I went to school and political philosophy. I went to school for things like sociology, which is the systemic study of society, so we look at social phenomenon, things that happen to social groups in society and impact society on a wider scale than just, you know, individual interactions, though those are included. And I also went to school for things like social justice and peace studies and political philosophy. So that's sort of where I come from. Uh, I work as a basketball trainer, if anyone's interested in that. I love basketball and I share some of the stuff I've learned through basketball training. But anyways, getting back to the topic at hand this evening. Now, um, I don't want to say anything to dispute what they're saying on the documentary. I think it's really well presented. There's a lot of hard work that goes into stuff like that, so I'm really sympathetic to that. Making videos for me is a challenge in itself. I can only imagine how some of these other content creators do it on the platform. My hat's off to you and my heart's out to you. Um, so what I just want to say here is in the terms of social theory or in the terms of analysis, and we can talk about analysis being like lenses or sunglasses that we can put on sort of thing to look at an issue in different frames. I think the experts that they've had on there currently and Shane's experience himself because he's somewhat of an expert with the YouTube platform and talking to other content creators um, has been wonderful and in terms of interpersonal interactions or how one individual thinks or may feel I think that's been very well captured. Now, some of the stuff that was hit on in the second uh, portion of that, which just released today, uh, was more sort of a macro level social analysis rather than just a micro level sort of individual analysis. Sometimes when we're looking at uh, phenom social phenoms or things that happen in the world, uh, we can say, well, yes, this happened to me as an individual, but maybe it happened to other people that look like me or in a similar social group as me. And we can see that there are various different levels. There's the interpersonal interaction. Then there are cultural or discursive linguistic levels. Like, you know, how people are represented in media and film and on institutional levels. And then also institutions themselves, such as the economy, government, and those sorts of things and how they function. All of those things combined are a way of looking at things that happen in society. I might be right here, or right here if you can see that on camera as like, you know, actually way down here, some 35 year old never made it streetball guy, right? Okay. There might be other people in society up here or in different locations. Everyone has different social locations in society. And how these things like individual interactions, the cultural and discursive level, and the institutional sort of macro levels all impact people is very different, right? Based on their location, based on their identity, based on their group memberships. Anyways, why I'm kind of going long and getting into this is I think we need to start taking a structural analysis on this because when we look at just the individual level what just I'm thinking in my head or what my genetics might be my personal identity and abilities we might be forgetting the social relations outside of that culture institutions and those sorts of things so we've been talking or they were in the sort of 
documentary about um, sociopathy, right? <clears throat> and commonly that's seen as an individual phenomenon or something that's limited to a person's biology. We see pictures of a brain and all that sort of stuff. And it's about an individual, a person, you know, a person wearing a mask, those sorts of visuals. Cool. But, and, and when we do so, we often critique that on the form of a threshold, an up or down scale, as in, you know, here's, here's the threshold and the person is or they aren't, right? Or, you know, just clear cut like that. As opposed to seeing these phenomenon as a spectrum, a wide range of behavior on a more horizontal sort of thing. So it's a state of being and there's a variety of degrees and also attributes and behaviors. And it's less clear cut, like, you know, just because somebody's here on the spectrum as opposed to here, what does that necessarily mean as opposed to this sort of threshold, yes or no, straightforward? So I think perhaps we could start looking um, at sociopathy or, uh, you know, poor behaviors, let's say oppressive behaviors, toxic attitudes, whatever you want to say, stuff like that, on a more spectrum, on a range, you know? Oftentimes, ADHD, for example, is categorized as just a biological uh, phenomenon where they're seen as, you know, the individual person, the child or whatever, it, there's something wrong with them genetically or biologically in those sorts of languages, right, or something wrong, you know, with just them as an individual. But then they're still using a cell phone all the time or have a lot of screens in their face all day long and as a result maybe don't have the greatest attention span and those sorts of things. You know, so they forget some of the culturally driven things. So um, I think sociopathy should be considered as more of a, a, a wide spectrum. And that it's a socially prevalent phenomenon because as it was described by the professional, they did a wonderful job. Uh, they explained that there was many behaviors, not just like a couple behaviors, not just like one person lighting something on fire makes them a sociopath, but there's a whole bunch of different behaviors, right? And a lot of them involve lack of emotion or lack of concern for other people and their states of being in the world, you know, uh, those sorts of things. So I'd like to start to question, you know, or put the question out there, in what ways does our society encourage some of those traits and behaviors? Like, keep in mind, we live inside of, you know, a capitalist sort of economy. We have, I live in Canada, but I often go to the United States for my partner's family. My partner, you know, even though we're not together right now, she's still my best friend. She's in Bogota, Colombia. I visited there as well too. A lot of these countries have things like war or inequality or poverty or their social exclusions or certain groups and certain identities and individuals in societies experience higher rates of things like incarceration or police violence or um, environmental racism or, um, sorry, there's a spider coming down from my ceiling and it's kind of scary, or, uh, you know, unclean water, things that other groups in society don't, right? At disproportionate levels or just completely don't altogether. Um, so I'd like to say that, you know, sociopathy, as we're framing it, might not be something that's limited to just individuals or single YouTubers. Because in fact, like I come from the streetball community, okay? Let me just identify that. You know, I love basketball. I go play basketball all the time. I train a lot though. People ask me, why don't you play anymore? Let me break it down one time right quick. You know what was really popular back when I started with streetball? Embarrassing people. And like specifically doing things like throwing through their legs around their back or off their head. Okay? And I had a, I, sorry, this spider's driving me crazy. I had an incident where I was in a gym. I was with a friend. I drove him there. There was another community member there, and I ended up playing one-on-one -on -one versus this other community member. And I had my video camera and all this stuff, and I was going to tape it. And I, at this time, I was going around the city. I was taping it all the time. I was going around different countries taping it all the time. I got boxes and mixtapes of doing this. But what happened was the game got a little heated. They were brushing up on me. They were playing a little physical. So my response was I did the street ball move where I bounced the ball off their head. And, you know, I threw it kind of hard, right? So I'm saying I bounced the ball off somebody's head. And it was kind of a whip, right, if you understand that what I'm saying from the streetball culture sort of thing. It's kind of accepted, but at the same time, super disrespectful. And I got to be careful because in the context of 2006, you know, uh, things were rough out there for certain groups in society. There's a war on terror. There's this war on drugs. There's all this stuff. And there's uh, lots of racism in society that's affecting different groups. And some of the people that I'm doing tricks on don't look like me. And further, I look over to the sidelines and there's this little kid watching and it turns out to be the guy's son, right? 
And is the basketball game really that important to me that I'm going to do some stuff like that and record it in front of this guy's son? Right? So at the time I thought it was cool and I bounced off a kid's head, whatever. I shouldn't even say kid. He was a guy a year younger than me or maybe even the same age. I don't remember. Community member. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. But anyways, my friend knew him well and I was driving my friend home and he kind of checked me on it and kind of told me about it. And at the first I, I, I was like, oh no, I can do this. Like it's, you know, I'm, you know. But the more I sat on it, the more I realized I was in the wrong. Uh, the more it was a tough pill for me to swallow. And I told myself I'd just never do that stuff again. You know? And uh, maybe, you know, I put that stuff down, I think it was like 2009. That happened around 2009. I misspoke when I said 2006. But I never, I never did that stuff again. And it was for that reason. Because I had recognized that I was participating in something that was socially approved. Like, it was cool to do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? It still kind of is in some ways, right? If I'm a white guy and I go into a certain community, I bounce off somebody's head, maybe I get some street credit that way, right? You know, that's literally, you get a thousand views, right? Great, sell a pair of shoes too at the same time. But here's the thing. Some ways, our society is encouraging that. It has nothing to do with just my biology or me as a person, right? And I was recognizing that some of the stuff I was caught up in, maybe I didn't really like it. Maybe like I... You know, once I turned on my critical thinking skills and became a little more conscious of what I was doing to other people or, you know, how they might have felt about my behaviors or what specifically that guy's child thought at the moment, it hurt my heart. So I was like, I don't want to do this kind of stuff anymore. I'm not saying don't do street ball, don't do tricks, whatever. Just, I'm saying me personally in that experience, I got to see how cultural influences, certain discourses out there, certain institutions that want to sell shoe brands and t-shirts and all that kind of shit, you know, will encourage you to do some kind of behaviors that we were just talking about, that we were limiting to the individual, and we were just talking about their brain, but at the same time, they make money from that, right? It's, it's, it's socially encouraged. There's a form of voluntary, you know, participation on my part, and there's a form of structural coercion in the form of maybe reward or views or whatever you want to say for my participation and at the end of the day I can say well I'm just running the trains I'm just doing my duty I'm just doing whatever you know I'm just getting my bag but I do have some responsibility in what this does to other people and some of the processes that I'm participating in and some of the relationships that go forward from that you know what I mean so um, when we look at an example like addiction like I'm an addict I'll be honest with you, you know what I mean? Like, I smoke pot, I consider that an addiction. I use uh, sport drink products, you know, that, like, um, pre-workout stuff? I use that shit before I go work out. I consider that an addiction, right? You know what I'm saying? I'm on the computer a lot. I consider that an addiction. So in some ways, I have behaviors that I would identify on the range, or the spectrum, I should say, is a better word, of addiction. And, you know, rather than just pointing at someone and saying on the threshold, yes or no, they're an addict and therefore yes or no they're a bad person society encourages addiction a lot of the time like coffee for example is you know the most widely circulated addictive substance in the world right um, people are you know they're addicted to their work people are addicted to driving people are addicted to sex people are addicted to all types of shit and society encourages that kind of stuff uh, you know drinking for example smoking cigarettes right like you know that used to be prescribed by doctors and shit like that right so, um, these sort of phenoms that happen in the world, the, why, the reason why I'm putting the word social in front of them is because I don't think they're limited just to the individual. And when we're talking about things like the sociopathy of perhaps YouTubers, you know, I don't think it's limited to just them as individuals or biology. I think the platform with its relationship to sponsorships, and AdSense and dollars and monetary flows and all this and these kids futures that are just trying to make videos to survive and you know and feed their families that sort of shit has a detrimental effect because it's not just one youtuber doing it it's fuck everyone on the platform's got to do some kind of shit for views type of vibe how is she going to be a youtuber right you know what i mean so like i think our language and our level of analysis or, or like how we're looking at things the glasses we're using, we need to change them a little bit, right? A lot of the times when we're talking about things in the world we dislike, things that we call quote-unquote evil, wrong, they can be instances of like structural oppression. And when we're talking about that, it's, you know, how 
there's unequal relationships between social groups and individuals in society upheld on the individual level like we're talking about, you know, on the cultural discursive one and on the structural one all at the same time. I think that like we often identify like punching a person or if somebody like bullies someone or if somebody, you know, says something even super racist, we can identify that and we say that person's a bad person. We can say, you know, that action is wrong and we often can say, you know, like you're a racist or you're whatever, right? And we leave it just at that individual, but we never look at the ways in which like masculinity teaches guys to fucking express themselves through fighting rather than honestly expressing themselves through emotions sometimes. How many movies, you know, teach us that sort of message? on the cultural and discursive levels, right? How many institutions favor guys yelling and screaming and fighting at each other, you know, and show that shit for views or money rather than, you know, guys carefully reasoning it out for fucking six days at a time and coming to a conclusion and hugging it out after with tears and all this next shit, right? Or like, you know, um, certain behaviors. Like, we can, we can quickly identify a behavior like addiction and we'll be like that person's an addict but we won't look at the ways in which our culture and our social environment has encouraged those behaviors and favored those behaviors in certain ways even if it's not always um explicit you know what i mean like yeah 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 fucking do it maybe it's implicit like for example in the level of like police murders and stuff like that we're super outraged and we often hold individual officers to account you know what I mean? Or we'd like to. We'd like to hold those individuals to account. But we fail to examine the way in which the culture of policing, policing itself, has been rooted in the violence and the oppression of certain communities. And which some of its language and discourse, if you read their training manuals, if you set foot in their station, breeds those sorts of behaviors. Right? They can put up those hand symbols and pictures and all that shit. You know exactly what I'm talking about. There's people within institutions that have open affiliations to white supremacist groups and all sorts of different shit in the world. And yet, you know, we're not, we, if they do something wrong, we say that behavior's wrong. But we fail to hold the institution and the culture to account, right? So, what I'm trying to say is, I think a, a more structural analysis is needed here. And uh, the other thing too is, this is, like, it's being framed by both Shane and the professional, and I don't want to take anything away from the professional, because we come from different fields. I come from a sociology, social justice perspective. We look at things from a structural point of view. And they're looking at things from an individual. How, how does the individual, how is this affecting the individual? And staying at the interpersonal sort of level. That's okay. They're both needed, okay? So I just want to say that I think the anti-social lens is just the wrong, it's a, it's, it's a red herring here. Because like, you know, like I was mentioning before, like I live in Canada, London, Ontario, Canada, on stolen native land. Since the time of colonization, war has been like a naturalized phenomenon. My, my countries go to war, governments go to war, but like free peoples and other groups in the world, they try to end them, they stop wars. Governments go to war, right? War is normalized. A soldier goes to war. You know what I mean? That's a job. That's a job. People aren't even forced into it. It's not even conscription. Back in the day, there was a standing army where they conscripted people. They forced people into it. And in some countries of the world, government service is still mandatory as a right of citizenship. For example, where my, where my partner's from, Colombia, as a right of citizenship, you have to engage in civil service, whether it's the military, the police, uh, you know, some kind of government institution of that form. You have to for a number of years. Just being a citizen, a native to that country, you have to. There's no choice about it, right? But in the United States and Canada, we have a volunteer army, so people do so for economic reasons. Maybe reasons of patriotism, what have you. When you break that down, when you break down the class composition of who's actually in the army, the poorest, maybe 20, 15% of the population, never go because those of us who are the most poor, those of us who ha are the most deprived of resources and food and housing and stuff like that and clothing and shelter, we can't go to war. We can't fight your wars. We're not strong enough. Those of us at the very top, who earn the very most in society, who have the most power and prestige and social privilege, 
you know, they don't go to war. The institution will, you know, favor them and allow them to escape. Presidents don't go to war. <laughs> when's, you know, when's the last, like, uh, you know, my prime minister's not going to go to war. He's going to start one, but he won't go fight them, right? But it'll be the middle, it'll be the middle ground, right? The people who have just enough to feed themselves and you know, get their family a little bit, they're going to be the ones economically encouraged to go to war, and it's going to be a promise to a little bit higher, in, in, you know, in terms of the social hierarchy, right? So why I'm saying this is because I don't think these behaviors are antisocial. I think they're social. And I think a, a better way of looking at it is I don't know if anyone's familiar with the uh, Milgram experiment. I don't want to go into the whole experiment, but it was basically a way of testing people's obedience to authority. And they would put them in a situation where they had to engage and participate in some kind of practice or behavior that clearly upon reflection or if they had taken a second they might not have otherwise done but because the orders were coming from somebody else or because they were told that this is favorable in terms of the institutional outcomes they would participate in it so like that's where I think we need to start moving for this analysis I think rather than saying that these behaviors are antisocial I think a lot of these behaviors are social because Yes, you know, the YouTuber might light a fire or they might use language that's inappropriate or do behavior that we look at as poor and toxic behavior. But at the end of the day, there are advertisements and corporations attached to those videos. And there are economic motivations and social phenoms behind some of those videos and some of those behaviors, right? So when we say that it's just anti-social behavior we forget that in some ways these individuals because it's not just limited to one or two youtubers this is something that's prevalent on the phenom I mean we see somebody in the entertainment or music industry die tomorrow and there will be people on the YouTube platform making videos with advertisements and you know smoking pens uh, ad placements right in them right away Right? And how is that any different than the individuals that we're talking about in the same documentary, right? In Shane's documentary. Um, so I don't think in some ways this is antisocial. I think rather this is complicity to authority. And it might not be explicit, like rah, rah, go burn your fucking house down. But, you know, these are the implicit messages on how to sell yourself and how to get a bunch of views and how to make yourself popular on a platform and how to get certain companies to invest money in you and to sponsor you so you can sell their products for them and influence younger generations of content creators, consumers, producers to mix those roles of consumer and producers and to take on some of those same behaviors for themselves. Um, now, I don't want to dismiss any of the work being done by other content creators. I don't want to say anyone can't go get money and try to do what they want in the world. I just think sometimes we need to be critical about what we're doing, and we need to be honest about it. Let's have a sober and honest conversation. Like, I'm a real person. I'm a huge fuck-up. I don't know where I'm going in life. I'm just trying to survive. Uh, I'd like to see my family again. I hope we can get them from Bogota, Colombia, back to London, Ontario, Canada. But you just never know with these governments and these institutions nowadays. But anyways... I think I'm going to close on this one and just say let's use a wider level of analysis. Let's take a structural sort of view that includes the cultural and discursive and the institutional relations behind some of these interpersonal phenoms or some of these individual level behaviors. And um, I think rather than using the lens of antisocial, I'd really like to start examining how when we live in a capitalist society where every single thing can be bought or sold and is up for sale, like my labor, my intellectual ability, my body, whatever the fuck, the natural world, you know, all forms of different things can be turned into, you know, diverse forms of capital. I think we need to start examining and start realizing that, you know, exploitation, harm, and things like oppression are kind of behaviors that are encouraged and, in fact, rewarded. And, uh, you know, like a lot of people engage in that sort of thing like you know a lot of content creators have 
you know, let's say like merchandise or different things like that. And they might not necessarily know who's making their own merchandise, but they know that if they make a video talking about merchandise and they promote their brand in a certain way that they can sell some merchandise. And uh, I'm not certainly against people making a living or doing that at all, but I think again we need to examine some of the practices and the social relationships we're engaged in. And, and that would require taking a more structural perspective than just an individual level one. So um, this has been my sort of, uh, you know, reaction and breakdown of the first two parts of the documentary. Again, I want to mention that it's really, really great. I think it's a, a super cool documentary. I think the documentary filmmaker Shane uh, does an excellent job on this sort of stuff. I think the professional that was brought in for both of them is a super great professional and probably really good at their job and if somebody needs them for that sort of stuff then hire them for whatever they're doing and if they have any work go reference it and go buy it. Um, watch Shane's videos and you know support content creators on YouTube. I'm not against anyone I just you know maybe I'm coming from a different perspective and if that hurts anyone's feelings I'm really sorry. Uh, you're free to contact me at any time we can have a conversation if you want to play basketball that's what I'm best at in life. So uh, let's do that. Uh, this is the last Uchiha here. Um, you know this is all I really have to say. I thank you for your time. Uh, if you want to get at me, get at me anytime. Take care and, and have a wonderful life until we meet again next time. Fuck the parliament, fuck the cops, and fuck the robber baron bosses, and fuck they offices. Predominant model of economics, and elephant cock in they ballot boxes. And fuck your profit, fuck your market, a pox on your pop stars, and all your paparazzi. Red carpet, the facades of the fortune. Fuck your border, fuck your law and your order. The right wing, born again, Christmas ornament, boys on the board, they pawns down in Ottawa. Fuck all of the honorable. Members of all of it Fuck your scholarship, man Fuck your colleges Fuck all the faces And all of your wallets And fuck Steven Fuck Justin Fuck Thomas Fuck the hope and the promise The drama You're voting, promoting Fuck your results, man Cops don't pay me for shots And fuck y'all Stock markets and profits And fuck y'all Bosses and punch clocks And fuck y'all Rocket and bomb droppers And fuck y'all Workplace coppins And fuck y'all Worst case options and fuck y'all Corporate fortune, warmongering, bomb-loving, economical. Fuck y'all <laughs>